Hi everyone, welcome to part one of lab five, protein synthesis. In lab three, you learned about the structure of DNA, and during your at-home experiment, you extracted DNA from the cells of strawberries and chicken liver. Now, although we've discussed the structure of DNA in quite a bit of detail, at this point, however, we haven't really discussed the importance of DNA. So in today's podcast, we'll answer several important questions. Why do we have DNA? What kind of information does it contain? And how do cells process and use that information? Remember from the lab on mitosis that the DNA within the cells of the body can be arranged into dark staining structures called chromosomes. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46. Now the DNA that comprises those 46 chromosomes is important because it contains the information that makes us who we are. This information is found in the form of functional units called genes. A gene is a specific unit of DNA that determines a particular trait. So for example, whether you're male or female, have straight or curly hair, brown or blue eyes, or have type A or type O blood is all determined by genes. Now these genes are located along chromosomes at specific places called loci. So for example, the figure you see at the bottom of the screen is a cartoon depiction of a human chromosome. The different colored bands you see along the chromosome represent different genes, and the location of the gene highlighted here with the arrow is that gene's locus on the chromosome. So we know that genes contain the information that determine our many unique traits, but that information by itself doesn't actually do anything. Okay, to better explain this, I like to use the analogy of blueprints for building a house. Okay, the blueprints for a house provide specific instructions for building the house, but unless there's someone who can read the blueprints and understand them, and unless we have a group of workers who are ready to hammer nails into some boards, the house will never get built. So the DNA sequence that makes up a gene is just like the blueprints used for building a house. And in order to make sense of this molecular blueprint, molecular workers within the cell are needed to make sense of that information and put that information to use. And these molecular workers are called proteins. But the question to ask at this point is, where do those molecular worker proteins come from? The instructions for making those proteins is actually contained within the DNA itself. Okay, now remember when we talked about cells, we looked at all the organelles that we find within the cell. And one of those organelles that we talked about was the ribosome. Now remember we said that ribosomes are found in two main places within the cell, attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum and scattered randomly throughout the cytoplasm. Also remember we said that ribosomes are important because they're protein factories. So in other words, the ribosomes somehow use the information in DNA to make proteins. But remember during our discussion of the cell, we said that in a normal functioning eukaryotic cell, the DNA is confined to the nucleus. So if the DNA is stuck in the nucleus, how then can it be used to produce proteins in the cytoplasm? In actuality, DNA does not directly guide protein synthesis. Instead, proteins are produced through two related processes called transcription and translation via intermediary molecules of RNA. Okay, now, RNA differs from DNA in three main ways. RNA is single-stranded, it contains the sugar ribose instead of deoxyribose, and it contains the base uracil instead of thymine. Let's take a closer look at RNA compared to DNA. In the figure, notice that RNA is on the left and DNA is on the right. Okay, the first thing that should immediately stick out is the single strand that comprises RNA. 
Also notice here at the arrow, the nitrogenous base uracil. Okay, RNA does not contain thymine. So everywhere we would expect to see a T for thymine in RNA, we find a U for uracil. So notice also that uracil, like cytosine and thymine, is a pyrimidine. As we mentioned, the third major difference between DNA and RNA is that RNA contains a different sugar than DNA. So to refresh your memory, take a look at the DNA nucleotide in the figure. Remember that the sugar in this DNA nucleotide is a 5-carbon sugar called deoxyribose. In RNA, however, the sugar is ribose. Take a minute and compare ribose and deoxyribose molecules that you see on the screen. You should notice that the two sugars look almost identical except for one major difference. Okay, look at ribose. Notice that attached to the 2' prime carbon is a hydroxyl group. Whereas in deoxyribose, the 2' prime carbon is attached to two hydrogen atoms. So the main difference between the two sugars is that deoxyribose is missing an oxygen atom at the 2' prime carbon. Hence the name deoxyribose. So again, keep in mind the three main differences between RNA and DNA as we move on. There are three types of RNA, and all three types are involved in the process of protein synthesis. The three types of RNA are messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. Remember when we talked about ribosomes, we said that ribosomes are made of two main components. They're made of protein and RNA. Specifically, those ribosomes are made of ribosomal RNA. Okay, we'll talk in more detail about messenger RNA and transfer RNA as we take a closer look at protein synthesis. One of the major concepts in bio biology is something called the central dogma. And now you may not have defined it as such, but it's a concept that most of you are probably already familiar with. The central dogma says that the information in our DNA is copied into RNA, and then that RNA copy is used to make a protein. Once again, this process occurs through two related processes called transcription and translation. Transcription is the process whereby the information in DNA is converted to RNA, and translation is the process whereby that RNA copy is used to make a protein. The figure you see on the screen depicts the overall process of protein synthesis, so take a moment and look closely at the figure. Okay, at this point we're going to move on and talk about the processes of transcription and translation, beginning with transcription. Remember that in the process of transcription, the information contained in DNA is copied in the form of RNA. And this process occurs in the nucleus, which in this figure is indicated by the purple area. Once the RNA transcript is made, it exits the nucleus, and thus it's in the cytoplasm where translation occurs. So let's take a closer look at what exactly happens during the process of transcription.
The process of transcription can be divided into three main parts, initiation, elongation, and termination. Transcription is initiated when an enzyme called RNA polymerase recognizes a specific base sequence in front of a gene called the promoter, which in this figure is the green stretch of DNA. Now this promoter sequence is just a specific set of DNA nucleotides. In eukaryotes, this sequence consists of alternating thymine and adenine nucleotides, and this TATA sequence is called a TATA box. So when RNA polymerase recognizes the TATA box, it binds to the DNA at the promoter and separates the two strands by breaking the hydrogen bonds between the bases. Okay, and in the process of elongation, RNA polymerase moves along the DNA using one of the DNA strands as the template to make RNA. So let's take a closer look at what happens during elongation. During elongation, the RNA polymerase molecule moves along the DNA, just like a train moving along a track. And as it moves, it reads the base sequence of the DNA template strand and pairs each base with a complementary RNA base. Notice that where you see an adenine nucleotide in DNA, RNA polymerase inserts a uracil in the RNA transcript. Notice also in the figure that only one of the DNA strands is being used as the template. So why doesn't RNA polymerase use the other strand? And why can't it use both? Okay, after all being complementary, the two strands contain the same information. Remember last week when we talked about DNA synthesis, we looked at the role of DNA polymerase, and we said that DNA polymerase is really picky. It's really picky because it only moves in one direction. RNA polymerase is very similar to DNA polymerase in that it's also very picky. It will only move in one direction. Notice the direction highlighted by the arrow in the figure. Like DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase will only move in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction, and as a result, it must use the DNA strand that runs 3' prime to 5' prime as the template. So although there are two complementary DNA strands, RNA polymerase can only use one of them. So during elongation, RNA polymerase moves along DNA in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction, making an RNA transcript as it does so. But how does RNA polymerase know where to stop? Okay, well, RNA polymerase stops when it reaches a sequence at the end of the gene called the terminator. Like the promoter, the terminator is just a specific set of bases that the polymerase molecule recognizes as being the end of the gene. When the RNA polymerase moves into the promoter, excuse me, into the terminator region, okay, that signals that it's reached the end of the gene and it releases the RNA transcript and detaches from the DNA double helix, allowing the hydrogen bonds between the two DNA strands to reform. Notice in the figure here the terminator region is the orange stretch of DNA. All right, that concludes part one of lab five. Before moving on to part two, make sure you are comfortable with all of the information that we have discussed thus far.